Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the second part of seminar uh, on civil society under autocratic pressure. In the second part, <clears throat> I would like to bring together um, the theoretical and the conceptual discussion we had in the first part together. Uh, and to do so, I would look at the case of Turkey under the AKP rule, and we will see uh, there are some similarities to both autocratic cooptation strategies as the critical scholarship within civil society uh, discussed, argue, uh, and also uh, there are some similarities um, uh, about contestation of brutal state power as liberal neo tocquevelian scholarship within civil society literature uh, discussed. Uh, however, we will also see that um, civil society under autocratic pressure, under democratic backsliding, diverges significantly from uh, both of them. Uh, and uh, to have a neat discussion on how uh, democratic backsliding affects transform civil society, I will offer a threefold framework, uh, repression, co-optation and contestation. And I will explain each drive, each mechanism in turn, but I would like to mention uh, from the beginning that these dynamics are not mutually uh, exclusive, but they go in parallel to each other. Sometimes they complement each other and sometimes they trigger one another. There is truly a dynamic interaction between them. So uh, let's start with repression. Uh, in Turkey, uh, historically, civil society has always been limited by centralized state power because of its decentralizing and mobilizing potential. And particularly following the 1980 coup, the military abolished all civic organizations and imposed severe restrictions on the freedoms of assembly and association. And the early years of the AKP and the short-lived EU integration prospect in early 2000s uh, were truly a, a brief break in this long status uh, approach to civil society. Um, AKP amended uh, some archaic laws that regulate associational sphere, eased some restrictive provisions, and also under the positive impact of the EU integration prospect, um, civil society organizations were involved in policy making uh, and public opinion formation back then. Uh, one example is the inclusion of women's organizations actively in lobbying the government um, preceding um, the approval of Istanbul Convention in 2010, 2011, 12. Um, but with the increasing autocratic tendencies of the AKP, civil society have become an open target. And 2013 Gezi protest was truly a turning point. Uh, and according to international civil society monitoring groups, uh, Turkey's civil society has become repressed uh, because of the impediments uh, uh, accessing the foreign funding, the preemptive detention, of activists, uh, compulsory notifications on a number of issues, um, difficulties in opening a new uh, a, a branch for an organization, etc. It has become repressed. And several civil society representatives indeed emphasize that since 2013 protests, the most frequent of these abuses, these restrictive measures is extensive and additional auditing, uh, frequent fiscal penalties, and at certain points, police raids to harass certain organizations. Yet 2016 uh, failed coup attempt was another turning point uh, when AKP recalibrated its uh, targeted repression towards civil society. Uh, more than 1,500 uh, organizations, foundations, and associations were uh, abolished, uh, closed off uh, without due court proceed proceedings. And it's not only those organizations that is affiliated with, uh, with FETA, Gulenist organization, but also several others uh, were closed. Um, and most importantly, after 2016, state repression has become selective, targeting individual human rights activism, such as academics for peace 
or detentions of people over social media posts or terrorism or criminal legal charges against uh, uh, activist journalists, for example. And selective repression usually targets organizations engaged in what is considered to be politically sensitive issues like human rights monitoring, uh, rule of law, minority issues, particularly Kurdish rights, uh, cultural dialogue, social justice, peace and reconciliation. And repression also targeted potential venues of mass mobilization through bans on the constitutional rights of assembly, uh, such as peaceful protests and curfews, especially uh, uh, in the Kurdish majority cities. And in December 2020, the government passed a new law titled Preventing the Financing of uh, and the pr Proliferation of Weapons of Mass Destruction. So the law allegedly tackles terrorism and in practice, it opens up the way for curbing legal activities of civil society organizations. And it forces annual inspections and high fines for fundraising that are deemed unlawful, a very abstract open concept, and the suspension of the entire board of an organization if a criminal investigation is undertaken about a member of the board. So if a member of the board faces criminal charges, the entire board of an organization can be replaced uh, for political motivations. Um, and of course, we know that since the individual activists are targeted for individual terrorism charges more and more, um, this law uh, opens up the way uh, for, uh, for, for further selective repression. Of course, um, selective targeted repression works for civil society in ways to drain the resources limited resources and energy of civil society groups and activist communities. Um, and the arbitrary nature of government's crackdown uh, exacerbates the, ex uh, the expectation of persecution uh, and obliges them to remain alert. The unpredictability of repression is the worst, actually, uh, what makes it uh, an effective tool for government for discouraging, intimidating, uh, local uh, uh, vocal uh, action. Um, in other words, mm, red lines are redrawn quite fast. Uh, what is tolerated or turned blind eye one day can become quickly a sensitive topic, a lightning rod for the government that would trigger repressive action uh, from one day to another, uh, so to speak. So in many ways, this imposes certain limitations um, Self-censorship, uh, to say the least, um, limitations on activism and vocal criticism, or avoidance from international donors. But of course, this is not the only picture, and we will see uh, in the uh, further parts of this uh, lecture, civil society organizations are quick uh, uh, activist communities are also quick to adapt to this selective repression uh, 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 in many ways. We will come to that point. But before that, I would like to turn to the second uh, uh, part of, of, of this trilateral framework I wanted to offer, uh, the dynamics of co-optation which is closely related to the dynamics of repression. It actually mutually supports, complements the government's efforts uh, uh, to, to, to control and utilize civil society for its own ends. Um, the AKP or autocratizing incumbents in general do not have an interest nowadays in closing off, totally sealing, uh, repressing civil society. And um, a few months after the countrywide Gezi protests in 2013, the Ministry of Internal Affairs in Turkey launched a civil society initiative, quite interesting, which intended to support uh, organizational and financial development of a strong civil society. And the ministry organized an international civil society expo where only chosen uh, civil society organizations were, uh, were involved. And the ministry claimed that they chose the ones that would not cause any nuisance, that are truly proven to be voluntary and charity oriented, not radical ones, not the marginal ones. And it was not coincidence that the government's attempt for encouraging an orderly behaving civil society um, right after uh, countrywide protests 
Uh, we have already talked about in the first part how authoritarian regimes have learned to repoliticize neoliberal, professionalized civil society. In Turkey, the AKP has created or encouraged the emergence of government-oriented civil society organizations, or the so-called gongos. Uh, those organizations have certain autonomy in terms of their activities and membership, but they have close ideological and even organic ties uh, to the government, rulers in power, and they are dependent on their resources. But how do we differentiate, how do we understand uh, these organizations? So first of all, they have immense financial power. Uh, they are mostly funded uh, by ministries and the AKP municipalities at local level, um, not only in terms of project funded, but they are also given a uh, transfer of immovables for uh, extensive periods of time to be used as office spaces, as dorms, etc. as we will discuss. Um, and they are also granted public benefit status by the Council of Ministers' decisions. This will allow them to collect tax-free, tax-deductible, de uh, uh, private donations. And besides the financial power, these government-oriented organizations also have symbolic power, thanks to the um, political assurance and support, like high-level uh, ministers, uh, representatives of the AKP, publicly endorse and encourage them uh, through regular meetings and participating in their organizational activities, inviting them for the policy making processes for consultations. And of course, symbolic power also signals um, an, in, an immunity from legal and bureaucratic uh, procedures. And these organizations have achieved considerable and impressive organizational reach. The most active ones we will discuss uh, uh, through examples uh, reach every city, even across province, uh, provincial levels. And this should be evaluated against the bureaucratic difficulties and delays that normally a civil society organization would face in Turkey. And the largest organizations that, that are autonomous, uh, working in similar areas like youth and women, they have two, three offices, mostly in urban, the biggest cities in Turkey, given that these organizations have spread all across Turkey. Um, so, um, well, these, of course, uh, government-oriented uh, 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 associations and foundations, they emerge in areas related to particularly um, family, youth, and women issues. And this is not a coincidence, uh, because this family, youth, women issues are considered a crucial aspect for the AKP strive um, to, to build a more conservative, heteropatriarchal, uh, nationalist uh, society, uh, uh, social values in general, and uh, to create a nationalist and acceptable form of citizenry. Uh, women are praised for their motherhood, youth are praised as, as representatives of the future generations and more religious uh, and nationalist generations to come. But what are the activities of these, uh, of these organizations. And I will start with uh, youth organizations first to give some examples. And of course, thanks to their organizational symbolic and financial power, they have uh, tremendous grassroots reach. They are not dormant organizations that open up branches all across Turkey and do nothing. They constantly actively engage with the youth, their target group. Uh, they are active at multiple levels, uh, but let's look at their discursive uh, uh, ideological commitment first. So uh, we see that the centerpiece of their ideal that is repeated in their, in their declarations uh, is, is, is to create a new nation in line with ethno-nationalist and religious doctrine, the so-called uh, cultivating native and authentic youth. Um, against the threats inside and outside, against the degeneration after the decades of secular, secular Republican ideals, uh, against the moral and spiritual degradation, so on and so forth. The claim for a new world, new Turkey, even a new generation frequently appears in their, in their discursive engagement. 
Um, but besides this ideological side, as I said, they immensely value presence on the ground, establishing links with the youth. Camps and summer schools, for example, are uh, one of the most common ways of engaging the youth ideologically, inject these ideas in them. Camps are organized according to age groups and always in gender segregated uh, locations and held in several locations. And uh, half of the day participants learn Islamic the theology and Quran and half of the day is spared for excursions, sports and entertainment and talks. Um, and activities and entertainment is at these camps are always managed also uh, because youngsters are encouraged to take on archery, shooting, horse riding as archaic sports. And both male and female participants are taken to excursions of the historic sites that is, you know, venerated in um, uh, national historiography uh, to the tombs of uh, to visit the tombs of the nationalist conservative intellectuals to attend lectures even on contemporary politics and debates taking place during these camps um, often um, reflect uh, the uh, uh, the the uh, the government's perspective, uh, uh, as I said, disperse the official historiography. And uh, for example, uh, they can cover uh, uh, in last year's like Turkey's ex military excursions in Syria, the presidential system before the voting, uh, historical and nationalist themes. <clears throat> they offer a very patriotically oriented nationalist revisionist indoctrination uh, uh, for them. And they also run school clubs so that be beyond camps and summer schools during the school period, they can also reach the youth. And they, these school camps run, uh, start at secondary school level up until the university level. And they also uh, offer extracurricular trainings free of charge, including you know, uh, languages and IT and coding, journalism, management, screenwriting, uh, aviation and drones, uh, photography. Uh, so they also are actively investing in the private uh, education sector. We said that how autocratic regimes in the first part um, turn to civil society, neoliberalized model of civil society. And these organizations, the youth organizations closed AKP, seeks to fulfill um, the state's role after state's withdrawal from the education sector by providing private schools and private dorms. And they are the servants of this neoliberal mentality, uh, fulfilling the, the role of the state uh, as the state withdraws from crucial uh, social provision sectors. And they also tap into the resources of youngsters. For example, they mobilize them on the streets uh, for certain uh, um, uh, for certain protests and demonstrations following the 2016 coup, these youth organizations, they were very uh, active uh, uh, on the streets supporting uh, democracy, democracy's victory over the coup makers. Um, and they were also uh, uh, mobilized uh, uh, for, uh, for electoral uh, uh, causes uh, for, for example, during the constitutional referendum 2017. Um, uh, one of the most well-known organizations, <clears throat> Tugva, for example, called one representative uh, from each dorm all across the country uh, to come to Istanbul for a three-day camp on the benefits of the presidential system. And after this three-day camp, these representatives were sent back to their dorms all across Turkey and informed, instructed that they should run a similar uh, camp, similar uh, engagement uh, talks with, the, with their fellow uh, uh, dorm uh, 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 friends uh, to tell them the benefits of, uh, uh, of uh, the presidential system. And, um, they are also mobilized uh, in voluntary campaigns. Um, uh, for example, often in line with the Turkish Development Agency and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, these youth organizations mobilize uh, 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 aid charity campaigns. And often they have particular political objectives in line with the AKP's foreign policy, this opening up to the spaces, uh, new spaces that has become lately a foreign policy priority for the AKP. For example, aid campaigns in 
the Balkans, Turkic republics, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sub-Saharan Africa, so on and so forth. Uh, but what impact uh, these organizations have? Uh, well, they do not force youngsters to join them, right? And they, they, they definitely promote a certain political, ideological worldview, but they do not force those youngsters to join them. Uh, they, do, they use their local presence, quite contrarily, uh, to become the center of politicized uh, leisure for the youngsters uh, and socialization. And within these spheres of politicized leisure, they uh, indoctrinate uh, youngsters, of course. Um, and, and the idea is, um, it, it is important not to mistake uh, these organizations is promoting Islam or Islamist ideas per se. Of course, there is always this religious part of the debate of the discourses and manners, but they do not want to shape individuals as good Muslims who would go back and you know become good Muslims in their private spheres. Islam is important in their discourse, in their activities, as long as it is connected, it, as long as it supports um, national identity to create Muslim nationalist subjectivities in the service of the state. Mm -hmm. And of course, all these um, networks connecting AKP as in the intermediary of, uh, of organizations and their target groups, uh, they, they build an intricate dense network of mutual benefit and clientelism. Before we move on to the third and final dimension, I would like to also briefly mention women's organizations close to the AKP, because there are several of them uh, emerged over the last uh, uh, over the last decade to strengthen and disperse this nationalist conservative gender discourse, a continuation of the youth discourse, very uh, uh, similar uh, linked. And the same story here, within a few years, uh, government-oriented women's organization, they established a widespread presence across the country. Um, and then uh, they are very active, uh, pursue several goals uh, at, at, and operate at multiple scales. Um, and for example, uh, they have actively sought to mobilize the public opinion in line with the AKP's gender discourse. And they often form a counter block to feminist autonomous women's organizations, um, uh, criticizing fiercely feminism as not uh, 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 among our traditional familial uh, values. Um, and one case, one example uh, uh, to give uh, maybe uh, uh, is the legislative change uh, that give religious authorities uh, uh, move to uh, the right to perform marriages. In 2017, AKP has introduced this legislative change, giving religious authorities the right to perform civil marriages while maintaining the non-recognition of only religious marriages. Remember what we said about autocratizing the democratic uh, backsliding process, that it is never directly against the constitutional or legislative principles, but always finding a, a gray hole, a gap, to, to go around it. The same uh, happened here. The proposal, of course, faced a backlash from many women's organizations. It was considered as a cynical twist to allow and encourage uh, uh, religious marriages from backdoor. And on the contrary, organizations close to the AKP are, took an affirmative stance of the, of the, of the, of the uh, proposed change. And through press statements and social media campaigns, and they they argued that the legislative change would promote individual freedoms by giving them, giving women, the right to choose, and it would eventually increase the number of civil marriages in rural areas. So you see how government-oriented or uh, civil society organizations work. Also, they serve as a legitimizing tool, uh, buffering potential public backlash on contentious policies, provide a justificatory uh, a coating uh, around the contentious uh, issues. Um, and of course, government-oriented women's organizations also indirectly uh, engage with women uh, through countrywide projects, uh, promoting parenting and familial roles 
for women uh, through their vocational training, uh, support for parents uh, with, for example, drug addicted children, integration programs even for women refugees, aid for, uh, uh, for poor. And these projects are often financed by state organizations, ministries, um, AKP municipalities for sure, but also for AFAD, uh, Presidency for the Disaster and Emergency Management, or ISHKOR, uh, the Employment Agency. And thanks for these projects, these uh, government-oriented women's organizations have been able to expand their, uh, um, uh, their reach out to women, their grassroots uh, links. And they, of course, they, they also have a discursive claim that they, they do not represent the well of educated urban feminists, uh, secular ones, but the majority of the women in Turkey with traditional values and daily concerns in rural Turkey. So um, I think I should move into the last and final part uh, of this uh, framework and uh, discuss briefly the dynamics of contestation. Under autocratization, of course, civil society also cherishes new forms and venues that defend the rights of association, assembly and expression, creates new uh, venues for democratic pushback and resistance. Citizens mobilize through social movements, networks, formal and informal organizations to create, to reclaim rights, to reclaim, recherish democratic governance. And that's why civil society also breeds contestations of democratic backsliding. And there are different reasons for that. First is that civil society is under repression, but remarkable counter mobilizations continue to emerge. Uh, and developments, gains, are a result of the efforts, sustained efforts of rights activists, despite all the repression. They seek to reinforce, uh, uh, to protect and promote civil society. And another reason is that as the AKP manipulates electoral and partisan arenas, uh, dissenting societal forces, uh, seeing that there is no meaningful participation maybe in the political process, they turn to civil society in increasing numbers, seeking alternative organizational forms, creating some complex and uh, uh, pluralistic civil society ecology, I would say. Um, after the uh, uh, 2013 Gezi protest, which was really a turning point for both the government, but also for civil society, activist communities, um, the civic space, civil society has become more densely populated by novel, localized, regional, but also national level uh, organizations to contest autocratic policy making in several areas. Um, and of course, uh, most of their concerns are diverse. Um, uh, they, they cover issues of environmental justice, women and LGBTQ rights pro-labor, including modern precariat, occupational security, neighboring associations. And most of the time, as the autocratization and repression targeting civil society comes with it, reached its peak, uh, they emerged in the forms of horizontally organized social movement type, informal, more issue-based ad hoc networks. Uh, I think it is important to mention those initiatives, those civic actors in the area of gender movement, uh, the pro-labor movement and environmental justice and the, the, the protection of commons area, because these are really the hardcore cases of contestation from within civil society, because women, precariat laborers, local communities have been directly affected by the authoritarian and the accompanying neoliberal decision making. We have discussed that uh, women's rights have become subject to AKP's conservative and nationalist agenda, uh, reducing women uh, to, you know, herders of the family, child bearers. And meanwhile, uh, femicides uh, 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 have been skyrocketed, domestic public violence and harassment targeting women. Um, have skyrocketed with impunity surrounding these crimes. 
And similarly, AKP's neoliberal developmentalism had been based on exploitation of national resources and land grab for infrastructural process, projects. And the long-term environmental concerns of local communities have led them to turn to civic action, uh, civic arena, civil society arena. And similarly, during the AKP, precarization <clears throat> has reached the peak. The AKP has used also Islamic arguments to justify precarity and occupational accidents that turned many people uh, to, to alternative arenas, to civic arenas, to, to, to mobilize against it. So what I call all these groups have advocated uh, uh, what, I, what I call tactful contention. So tactful contention encompasses first outside lobbying strategies, repertoire, such as mass protests, disruptive actions, of course, the typical repertoires, but also off the streets, uh, 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 mobilization like legal activism, litigation, public awareness campaigns uh, uh, spanning across uh, local, regional, national arenas. And the second uh, uh, aspect of tactful contention is the, I already mentioned, the informalization of organizational structures. Tactful contention in the end is a survival strategy adopted by autonomous civil society groups uh, while the regime's nature uh, 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 allows, as long as the regime's nature allows a certain degree of openness uh, to oppositional activities and contention. Um, um, as we said that because the democratic backsliding countries, autocratizing countries, they are not interested in totally sealing off closing uh, civil society sphere that creates a civil society dilemma for them. Um, so considering the level of repression, on the other hand, many of these civic actors uh, pulled out a diverse and innovative action re repertoire. And despite all the preemptive detention and terrorism charges, uh, these action repertoires, the streets remains as a you know, natural habitat for civic uh, groups, civil society in, in Turkey. Um, so of course, all these uh, groups, of course, these groups utilize um, street action protests for multiple purposes. For example, women's groups uh, use it to object legislative measures concerning women to raise awareness. And similarly, environmentalist groups and activists have grown a tremendous capacity to sustain contentious action expanding over several years, even decades, about the, for example, energy-related construction uh, uh, projects. Uh, they utilize common mobilization strategies of social movements, sit-ins, protests, pickets, refusing to leave the construction zone, etc. And while everyone is, has been discussing how the traditional strong trade unionism has been crushed in Turkey since 1980, cool, the rise of work accidents, the subcontracted workers, and the you know, emergence of modern precariat have revived mobilization for socioeconomic rights for working conditions. Uh, this has been reflected also in an in increase in Turkey in the number and spread of organized labor strikes that lasts between days and months. And one of the latest emanations of this issue was the large scale strikes and protests of unorganized laborers working in the sector of delivery. And of course, uh, off the streets medium, outside lobbying strategies, litigation at national and international courts, disobedience, reclamations of space, um, agenda setting through social media, um, they have become, they have constituted the majority of the collective action also uh, within civil society. Um, and what is important, in my opinion, is that these autonomous groups within civil society have gained an impressive capacity to switch between these repertoires of action as the repression has gained a new momentum across different different periods. They adapt to, they steer political repression through tactful mobilization by switching between these mediums. And at the same time, localities, local levels uh, have become a breeding ground for experimentation in thinking and acting about democratic rights alternative participation. Uh, these experiments, of course, conjoined uh, 
bottom-up attempts to resist and push back democratic erosion. They insisted on, on, on human rights and they insisted uh, uh, on participation. And just to give one example, uh, uh, the councils by women, assemblies by women, Kadın Mejlisleri, have initiated an exemplary case of effective grassroots mobiliza uh, mobilization uh, by establishing these uh, councils at city, district, and even university levels. And through these local gatherings, women sometimes converse about a particular case of discrimination, uh, of payment in a specific workplace, or a case of sexual abuse at, at, at a university or a workplace. And the aim is to convene women regardless of their partisan or ideological affiliations, and to focus solely on finding resilient solutions to the gender, social, and cultural life in Turkey. Uh, and, and such experimentations have created an unprecedented form of grassroots direct participation in Turkey, uh, as the other types of participation channels have, have been closed uh, uh, due to the democratic backsliding conditions. Um, so this dynamic contestation within civic space uh, uh, points out uh, the sophistication and the expansion of the socio-spatial range of demands for participatory democracy in the long term. Uh, these new and emerging practices of participation and democracy are based on a new understanding of uh, uh, fluid political subjectivity, rising democratic expectations at grassroots level, despite uh, at the institutional at formal level, autocratization is, is ongoing. And they also breed fragmented, but dynamic patchwork of multiple identities. They point out to the rising dynamic uh, democratic expectation and hopes for uh, direct uh, engagement. And also importantly, Autonomous civil society uh, with its multiplication, with its pluralization, uh, 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 of course, brings together diverse groups across class, across issue areas, across dominant sociopolitical cleavages, such as Kurdish, Turkish, left, right, secular, re religious, um, which, of course, this cross class, cross ideology, cross cleavage engagement helped them. Uh, uh, expand the grassroots space of mass mobilization against autocratic state practices. And uh, we don't know what the future will bring, how these uh, newly emerging arenas of contestation will evolve, will make more connections. Uh, but uh, it, it definitely points out to a highly politicized and oppositional sector within civil society that has profoundly altered the enjoyized a project-driven civil society uh, also that was uh, foreseen by, by, by liberal scholarship, um, by expanding civic engagement to groups at the neighborhood level, rural populations, provincial level, uh, uh, and different, uh, different audiences. So uh, let's try to wrap up. I've been quite long, I think. In this seminar, we looked at the dynamics and the transformations of civil society under autocratization, under democratic backsliding through the case of Turkey. And we tried to bring an alternative perspective on how authoritarian regimes are built in kind of former uh, democratic context where democratic legacy sort of existed. Uh, but we said that there is an institutionalist focus in democratic backsliding uh, literature that dominates uh, the, uh, the area at the expense of explaining how authoritarianism, democratic backsliding is built from below to re-engagement with key social groups. Um, uh, this is why we identified civil society as a contested terrain where autocracy can be diffused, entrenched, but also resisted and challenged and contested. So civil society can abet both democratic and undemocratic forces in the end. Uh, overall, civil opposition, civil society uh, have uh, uh, serious constraints, uh, but um, mm, we, we try to simplify it through a through lateral framework, repression, cooptation, and contestation. Uh, and uh, 
I want to emphasize that the legacy of civil society, mobilization, and democratic practices that precede democratic backsliding is an important factor that shape all these three dynamics, uh, particularly the content contestation dynamic. Um, and uh, this actually makes civil society under democratic backsliding different than what both liberal scholarship assumed and what also the critical scholarship, particularly with a focus on uh, 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 autocratic, long-term autocratic context uh, assumed also. So I would like to finish with a wise observation uh, by Rish Meir and, and colleagues from uh, a, a work from 1992. Uh, they argue that civil society can be linked to democratization after autocracy, in our case, redemocratization or better democratization, hopefully, after autocratization to the extent that it empowers previously excluded and subaltern groups as long as it, it involves their demands, as long as it involves new voices within civil society. Um, so with this cautionary note, uh, thank you very much for being part of this seminar and special thanks to those who made it up till this point. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>